drugs, money, mansions, and private jets. A myth is being created around the narco culture. Narco culture has gone mainstream and can be seen in various areas like music, religion, soap operas, fashion, and language. But it's not all the pretty roses people like to see. Join me as I tell you the truth behind cartel life. This is narco culture. The first time I met the Flores brothers, um, prior to even meeting Cato, I was at Hoops downtown, a famous gym uh, where most people rented courts at night and uh, gathered with their friends and uh, played hoops. Uh, R. Kelly frequently played there. Jordan, some of you know, out of town basketball stars used to go there. It was a pretty popular spot. A lot of celebrities there all the time. Um, I mean, it's a couple hundred dollars or a hundred dollars and some change an hour. Um, you know, you're getting it four or five hours at a time. Um, I had been invited there by Big John, rest in peace, who I met at a uh, clothing store called uh, 600 Collections on the West Side through my mixtape distribution um, ordeal. And uh, he wanted to talk about possibly managing me or coming on uh, board to be a, a tour DJ with Rob. And, uh, I was making hand, uh, money hand over fist on mixtapes. Uh, and from the year 1999 through 2000, I had a popular mixtape brand called Damien Cash Presents. And I uh, had H&IC, uh, Dead Presidents, R&B Thugs, Big Truck Boys. Um, this is when I started to make like rap mixes. Uh, before then I started with freestyle tapes and uh, house tapes and ghetto house tapes. So. I've been doing mixtapes for, uh, you know, since 99, but I really didn't start the whole Damien Cash brand until about 2000-ish. So from 2000 through 2003, mid-2003, um, I wasn't even really putting mixtapes out in 2003, just maybe a few, but I would say a three-year run, I put out a good 300 titles. So I was pretty busy doing that, making a lot of money. I, I was making drug money off of mixtapes. Um, I had a brand new Navigator, rims. I was iced out, latest of fashion, best kicks, you, you name it, I had it. I, you know, I had a couple of vehicles out there working for me. I shipped to 13, 14 different states. Um, and this is what led me to meet uh, the Flores brothers, I was there, played a quick game and lost on uh, on uh, R. Kelly's court, which was the first court. And next to them adjacently was the twins. And they were playing with a bunch of characters from the neighborhood, from Little Village, a bunch of Latin Kings. Maybe there was a couple of guys that could, um, could play some basketball there. Um, and shout out to Benny. I think Benny was there, Little Village. He's still organizing sports for the youth there in, in uh, Little Village, doing uh, positive things with his life. Um, I see you, I watch you. Um, and another good person that I met through my travels and my dealings with uh, the twins and Cato and Little Village. Um, so I... Um, get approached by them off the side. There was like these curtains that would divide the courts and they, I, you know, I was kind of on the side trying to see what they were doing over there. And they came over and they, you know, they see I'm the only Mexican there. And uh, they're like, well, what's going on with this guy? What's he doing over there with all these, you know, there's a court full of black dudes. Uh, maybe he plays good, you know, they, so they started by inviting me to play one game real quick before I, you know, was up next there. So. I said, all right, cool, no problem. I don't want to get stiff and cold. So I go, I play a game with them and they're betting large amounts of money. There's cartel people there. You know, I'm not even really knowing what's going on. I, you know, I just kind of stepped into the shit and, and played a pickup game with them. 
and uh, you know they're betting thousands and thousands of dollars like it's a dice game or a, 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 a horse race you know uh, just gambling and I was like wow this is insane there's nobody really here with like that level of talent I don't, I don't think even where I was playing they were that good on that court with our, you know, our Kelly's all right. A couple of the guys there were, were you know, semi-pro basketball players, but they still weren't at the level where they're betting money. So I found it odd that they were betting money, and I was, you know, then that kind of opened my eyes. I said, oh, well, maybe, you know, these guys are up to some shit, and they just got money to burn. You know, they got to be, you know, maybe they're drug dealers or whatever. And you know, I I knew of them. And I used to see them in the neighborhood and I would maybe sell them a CD through their window. Um, I used to post up on 26 and Sawyer with a good friend of mine, uh, Lou and, uh, and, uh, and Oscar. And we used to kind of hang out there and I, I worked in the stand in the discount mall before I started distributing mixtapes. So it's kind of why Little Village became the neighborhood that I decided to try to like sell my mixtapes through hand to hand um, and start my distribution because I only knew the stores there in the discount mall and in the mega mall and in the super mall and that's kind of like how I started with my accounts and then I just branched out and started looking for stores everywhere. Um, but not so they asked me to play. Um, I play with them and uh, my 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 game is up next door so i go back over there and go back to playing there you know i didn't think nothing of it it was a brief meeting uh, i go outside and i do my regular thing i pop my trunk open i got my tv's sound blazing i'm playing my latest mixtape and all the guys from the court the basketball court come over and you know try to buy some cds buy here you know two three cds here make a quick couple hundred dollars at the end of playing ball and uh, I'm sitting there, I'm still talking with Big John and a couple of the guys and Blackie, who's a, a good friend of mine. Um, and, you know, they, uh, you know, they take off and the twins start coming out and they're like, oh, what, what are you selling? I, you know, I sell CDs. And they're like, you know, they just straight approach me about work. They're like, man, man, you ain't getting all this off of CDs, man. What you need, bro? You around all these people, you can make some money. We walk the bam. If you need something, we could get you. We could facilitate. And I'm like, nah, bro. I, this is what I do. I'm, I sell mixtapes. This is how I get my money. Um, quiet is kept. You know, the RIAA had already set up an office in Chicago and was looking for me and a couple other people that were bootlegging Titanic uh, movies. And I was kind of on the radar to. Uh, what most people when i tell them my story about my mixtapes label me as oh they were about to dj drama you um and uh you know they were hot on my heels all, all the stores were all over me uh you know telling me hey they're asking us questions about you and can we put an order in with you to have you come here and deliver cd so this is like my first real feelings like you know whoa i'm really doing something illegal here and at the same time i'm meeting these you know street drug dealers drug lords cartel people and i'm like i might as well be selling drugs if they, these people are they're trying to set me up and do a controlled buy with some cds you know my face is on my cds at this time i'm you know i'm caught red-handed is what i'm thinking so I just left the CD game all the way alone right then and there. I decided to quit. And uh, this is when, um, you know, it's kind of like the crossroads for me. You know, the, the, the twins start off by buying a box of CDs off me, which I thought, thought was weird. I only had like four or five different titles and there's, you know, a couple hundred CDs in there. I sell them to them for $5 a WAP, which is what I sell them to the stores for. I make a quick rack. I think nothing of it. Out comes Cato and Val from the gym. I'm like, who's that? And I'm like, oh, that's Cato. I'm like, oh, I sold him some CDs before. They're like, yeah, he's a, he's a Trumbull 2-5 and that's his girl. Don't look at her though, you know? 
he'll get pissed off. He's very overprotective of her. And at this point, one of the twins in the back gets to commenting about personal things uh, with, with this woman. You know, I put all this shit together uh, long after this all went down. And, you know, my personal belief is that, you know, they had something going on. You know, he commented on the texture of her skin and how soft it was and this, that, and the third, like he had been intimate with her. This is prior to me meeting Cato. Um, and I didn't think nothing of it until long after and everything happened with, with, uh, with them. But um, my first job with them was to come on board, sit Cato down, let him cool off, and I would take care of his runs for him. I'd basically be a ghost for him. Um, and, you know, I needed to make good money. I was making really good money off of CDs and that was being taken from me. Um, so I decided to say, fuck it, let's do it. And at first I had no communications with Cato. Um, I, I worked for the twins and, uh, you know, everything was smooth, everything went well. I started making decent money and I would hang out with them. We'd go eat places and hang out and talk and do all types of shit, you know, go paintballing, hoops, go eat at fancy dinners, meet people. Um, and uh, I started noticing things started to get heavy and thicker and deeper and, you know, more risque. And um, around the same time, uh, I believe there was friction between Cato and the twins' relationship and how much they were controlling what he was doing and his clients and who he had under him and he didn't like that. I mean, as no man really wants no other man are kind of over their business. So um, he started to look for work elsewhere and, you know, he found a couple of other different connections and started to try to part ways with them. But at that point is where um, I had to make a decision. He didn't want to lose the fact that I was reliable and could make all his rounds for him effortlessly and seamlessly without a hitch and nothing would become up missing or, you know, I was very trustworthy, you know. I was wet behind the ears, I was green and I was just learning this shit and these people were teaching me this and I, you know, the last thing on my mind was double crossing anybody and anybody that had that type of power. So. Um, I decided to, uh, part ways and the, the twins were like, well, you could do whatever you want to do. You know, we could figure out something for you to do for us, or you could go with him. And it's like, no problem. Wody is like their number one word, you know, like, don't worry, but we still be cool. It's all good. You know, he's still our boy and this, that, and the third, and we'll still hang out, you know, but. He just wants to do his own shit his way and, you know, just, you know, be careful. And uh, I decided to uh, continue to work for Cato directly. And then we became really tight and he started to ask me about my music stuff and he did a ride along with me. I decided to put out a couple of mixtapes again and try to like make a comeback a uh, couple mixtapes. And he rode along with me and saw like what I did and how I did it. And he fell in love with music. And he was like, well, how do we do this legit? And uh, I was like, well, I'm kind of already trying to start a record label. I kind of got an artist already, you know, I don't know what I want to call it. I don't know what I want to do. And then, you know, just like any hustler, you know, we forget about the conversation and go on to flipping whatever it is we're flipping and doing whatever it is we're doing. And then, you know, one day I decide to up and uh, we were, I think it was me and a, uh, my friend Ish, who I was partners with at the time with uh, some cell phone communication places. We head out to go incorporate something overnight because we were opening up a new shop. Shout out to Ish Entertainment, Mr. Nino. My brother, I've known him a long time. Um, 
And uh, I decided right on the spot. I was like, man, I need to go ahead and incorporate something to do with this music thing. And that's where, if you look on my Instagram, you'll see the incorporation papers at the Secretary of State. I decided to incorporate, it, incorporate the narrow records. And that was the start of it. And uh, we started off modestly in a basement uh, with uh, Mike Snotty, the, you know, Grammy nominated producer as producer Diddy and a slew of other artists uh, in the music industry down in Atlanta. Shout out to uh, Snotty. Um, and we were in his basement and I had three or four rappers there or, and we just went on a beat I believe it was I can't remember if it was the ether beat or something of the sort and we got on bad boy radio shout out to Mike Love and the Diz um, and that was my first ever uh, piece of work that I did for music and um, it, it just uh, kind of sparked interest in Cato and he was like, well, how, how did you do that? How did you get on there? And how did you make that happen? And I was like, look, dude, I'm starting to record with this artist. You need to show up to the studio. And he would blow, blow me off. He blew me off two, three times. Um, matter of fact, the first time he came to the studio and met Prophet, he was like two hours late. And he had told me, man, go ahead, book the session. I'll, I promise I'll make it there. I'll go 50-50 with you. And I'm sitting there, you know, I'm not having a whole lot of money at the time. And uh, he's just like two hours late. I'm like, bro, wh where were you? Oh, I was buying a Hayabusa. Sorry. No, he didn't even say sorry, which is what pissed me off even more. I'm like, bro, I take this shit serious, bro. Like, you told me you were coming and you were going to split this bill with me. I've already came to the studio three, four times and you've never showed up and you want to do music. You keep telling me you want to do music. And he just looks at Val and he throws some money at me. And he's like, man, fuck this bullshit. I don't need to hear this shit. Let's go, Val. And he took off. And then somehow I end up over by Hot Boys Car Wash on the day that my uh, freestyle with um, Bad Boy Radio, which is Mike Love and the Diz, was about to air that day. Um, and I'm in the car with him and an old friend of ours um, who also was in the music business. So now, I'm about to play this on radio and the guy in the back's like, oh, you do music, I need your help. This, that, and the third. Um, shout out to Static. You know, you know, you know who's in the back seat. Um, and uh, he's like, I've invested millions of dollars into this shit and I can't figure it out. I can't even get on radio. And I'm like, yeah, well, my rappers are about to come on radio right now. Um, and mind you, it was a modest, uh, Flex, you know, we were, we were just being highlighted, but we had been highlighted for the last couple of weeks and it just happened to be that I'm there. And, uh, and Cato right away, he's like, yeah, we're doing this music shit, man. We're about to do this shit big, man. I'm, I'm, I've been thinking about this shit for a long time, this, that, and the third. He's like, yeah, check this out. Like he immediately assumed ownership of the situation. And I was like, all right, I guess however I could get you on board, to fuck with me, dog, I'm with it, let's go. This this is yours too, it's on the radio, let's go, let's do this. I, I was more concerned with who's gonna finance this shit because I knew it required money and more money than I had to give at the time. So um, that's really, I think, where it clicked for him. He heard it, he, he saw me have a vision we rot, rode and talked about it when I uh, we, we, he went on a ride along with me selling my mixtapes and we talked and talked and talked and how would we do it and who would we who would we get to feature and how would we put the album together and how, where are we going to record at? You know, we had all these conversations and nothing was solid. I knew nothing of how I was going to do it. You know, 
uh, slang recordings was a, a, a yellow page book and I went to recording studios and I saw uh, recording tracks or I believe it was called is uh, tracks recording at the time um, and I didn't even get tracks recording I ended up getting slang and that's how I booked my first session and how we even met uh, Vince um, to record I had none of it figured out I just knew I wanted to do music and then he wanted to do music as well and that day when he heard it on the radio it was like it materialized for him and it materialized for me and he realized okay this guy means what he says and this is what he wants to do and here he is with how hardly any money he's on the radio let's do this and uh here we are, you know, 17 years later talking about what could have been, you know. Not a lot of people know what was in that album, the hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars that was spent in that album from Fat Joe to DMX doing the remix or slanging them things and willing to do other records with profit from Fabulous's um, Wild Hunter song from three Kanye tracks with one Kanye track with him on the hook. Um, and who you name it, every every producer who's a somebody right now from uh, Extreme to Boogs to, you know, No ID, uh, all of these people were people that we were shopping tracks from and getting tracks from for the album. So, um, what could have been yeah, something amazing, something great, but that's not what God's plan was. And here we are trying to pick the pieces up uh, 17 years later still to the date, talking about it, heard about it. Uh, and, you know, that, that was my first meeting of these guys, the twins and uh, and Cato, and it was a wild ride. It's it's still unbelievable. I sit here and I look at everything before me, the time that they've done, the time that I've done in prison. Um, my case had nothing to do with their case, but I still ended up in the same situation. Um, and in my last video, I say the same thing. You know, what would have happened had he had not died? What type of indictment was that going to be? All of us rolled into uh, a sushi roll, you know, uh, uh, red-handed in the cookies in the pot, in the jar, you know. Um, those, those times would have been astronomical that we would have gotten handed down. Um, but I'm in the process of launching my own YouTube channel, people. Um, it's going to be called Cash's Couch, and it's going to be more about music. Uh, my first guest on the show is going to be Prophet, and we're going to talk in detail the concoction and the production of the album um, and how De Niro came about and how we all met and how we uh, created the, the project that I call it that, that never was, that, that could have been. Um, and here's just another short story. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And stay tuned. We've got plenty more to talk about. Lots of capers, <laughs> licks, tricks, you name it. You know, th that life comes with all that attached to it. So um, this is just one of many uh, clips that you'll get from me. And... Uh, God bless you guys, and uh, we'll see each other soon again.